On this video I'm paying homage to a top 10 list I did a while back called Low Complexity but High Depth Games. It was my most watched video on this entire channel. So of course I need to do a part 2. Hi everyone, welcome to The Broken Meeple, I'm Luke Hector, your host, and if you like what you see and want to check out the rest of my content, then please consider subscribing if I've earned your subscription. And if the games I'm talking about on this list take your fancy, then consider acquiring them from zatu.co.uk, where you can use my code at the bottom of the screen and in the description to get 5% off on your entire basket of games. If there's a gap on your shelf that needs filling, consider a purchase and fill it up soon. So what's the purpose of this list? Well, a while back I did a list called Top 10 Low Complexity but High Depth Games. The idea was is that I wanted to think of games that I enjoyed where it didn't take much to explain the rules or to get into the feel of the game, but when you were in that game, the depth ratio to the complexity was a, like a perfect sink. You always were thinking, you had in meaningful decisions to make, and you know, despite all that, I could get the rules explained to you within a reasonable set of time, so that it wasn't necessarily the rules dump that was hard for the players to understand, it was, it was more how to actually do well at the game. But those sort of games are great because you, you play them, you get them done nice and quick, it may overwhelm the person at first, but then you're like, well, I get it, but ah, oh, these things are starting to click now, can we play it again, because now I know what I need to do. Those sort of games really work well with people. It is my current most watched video on this channel. I forget what the numbers are, something like in the mid 40,000 views for it, which I know, yeah, baby compared to all the big cheese, but come on, I'm small fry, give me a break, all right? I'll take, I'll take this mantle if I can help it. But it's a really popular video, but it was popular both for good and bad reasons, because everybody's distinction and definition of what is low complexity and high depth is somewhat widespread. So it got its fair share of comments of, oh yeah, this is cool, you know, I like this choice of top 10. Here's my list of top 10. Oh yeah, and these are really cool, let's debate them. But then it was supported by this side of the coin, which was, you deserve to burn in hell, pitchforks, rage troll. We have found the witch, may we burn her? You know, who basically sort of thought you didn't deserve to exist because apparently your definition was different from theirs. Oh, well, welcome to the internet, I guess. So I figured, well, you know, people have heavily requested this on the Patreon page, so this was definitely the most requested video to be done out of the top 10 lists I've got planned, and so I figured, why not do another list? Now this list is not intended to replace the previous list, it's just meant to sit alongside it. So that was a 10 through 1, and this is a 10 through 1. This is not my 20 through 11. And there's going to be games that I mention on these lists that you probably wouldn't consider, in which case fair play, discuss why you don't think so. But then also there's going to be games that you think should make these lists and still haven't, in which case by all means get them in the comments below and tell me and others why you think they meet that category. Of course I want this video to be a good kind of resource for people to find these types of games because it is one of the most popular. So without further ado, let's get cracking. And number 10 is a nice little puzzle game by Blam Games called Chakra. Chakra has you trying to harmonize the chakra in your body. You've got this column full of different bubbles with three little pods in each and you're trying to match the colors to the pods. So three green in the green bubble, three orange in the orange bubble and so on. The idea is, is that the crux of this game is very simple. You've got three actions and one of them is just a clear up exercise at the end of the day. The real depth of this game though is trying to be efficient with the actions that you have in order to move the gems up and down this column. You've got negative energy, the black energy which you want to try and get out of your columns because it's essentially taking up space. You know, you're, if you fill up a bubble with gems and they're not harmonized, then they block movement for the others. You've got to try and free up movement. So it is like one of those, imagine like the, the four ring puzzle when you were a kid, where you had like the four poles and you had the rings on one side and you had to try and move it to like in such a way that you could get the four rings stacked from one end to the other. It's kind of a bit like that, but turned into a very pretty and nice little puzzle game. The game is not very complex, it's not particularly long either. Granted, not much reason to play it with the full player count, it's really best as a two player game and there's no solo mode, but for a simple teach, this is just a nice quaint little puzzle game that most people have probably never heard of. It was a hidden gem at the UK Games Expo, it's still in my collection, 7 out of 10, I believe I've done a review of this one. By all means, check it out and see if it's something you might enjoy. 
From a number nine, we turn to a recent game in my collection called the Isle of Cats from the City of Games. In the last list, I put Baron Park pretty high up the list as my polyomino style game. And if I was to put the two alongside, I would probably still put Baron Park ahead of this one in terms of where it would rank in this category. But still, there's not a lot of rules in Isle of Cats, and the premise is, like you would get in most polyomino games, here's a bunch of Tetris pieces, get them on your boat in a particular way and be efficient. The added depth for this one, though, is in the card deck. As well as putting these cats on your boat, you're also trying to fulfill lessons which are kind of objectives of scoring points. In order to get cats, you've got to get baskets, which is another type of card. On top of that, you've got treasure cards, which can get you cool treasure pieces for points, but they also take up space. And some of them are generic and some of them are worth points. The common and the rare treasures. And of course, everything is all different sizes, typical Tetris pieces. And you're trying to think, where can this go? Cover the rats, fill up the rooms. There's all sorts of different ways that you can approach this game, particularly from those lesson cards. And they are really the crux of the depth here. If it was just literally, oh, just get the pieces and put them on your boat, then it would pretty much be a clone of Baron Park that takes longer. Here though, unlike Baron Park, you've got those cards that allow you to maybe try some different paths to victory or you know one day I'm like oh I'm trying to get one of a particular family of cats uh, the last game I played I tried to go all around the edge of my ship and then work my way in sometimes you go after the room sometimes you just cover the rats you know there's a lot of different ways to approach it but the rules pretty straightforward the rule book is very easy to read it's you know big and big font with a few pictorial examples but even then it's just a case of oh you got a little drafting phase then you get the cats and then you play some cards rinse repeat Five rounds. Okay, not too complex, you know. I literally taught myself from the rule book while teaching three other players how to play this game, and we all got on pretty fine. Granted, I'm more used to games, but still, I don't think this is a particularly complex game to learn. And if you really want to take the complexity down the notch, you could always just play the family mode that's in this game, which removes some of the card aspects and gives you more of that Tetris feel. So, whatever level you're at, you can tailor the game to your heart's content. It looks absolutely gorgeous on the table though, and if you're like me and a bit of a cat fan, then yeah, you're gonna love the pictures of all these cute little adorable little kitties on all your Tetris pieces. Stop. Come on, hang up. But it's beautiful, looks great, definitely worth my number nine. On one of these selections, I'm going to get a box that doesn't have a white cover, so I don't have to mess around with the glare. Yes, my number eight is Viral. In fact, I only just played this the other week, actually. It's been good to get it off the shelf. Viral is a straight-up area control game. You're all playing diseases, and you're infecting a man's body. Don't worry, the man survives at the end of this. But the idea is, is that all the different organs, kidneys, pancreas, brain, lungs, heart, whatever, are all areas for you to control. And you control them in order to score points, but the more points you score in a round, the more chance you have of, like, I call it House MD and his various doctors are able to knock you out of the system temporarily, so you've got to build back up. You play these cards which allow you to do different actions and different organs, like move, infect, battle, defend, reinforce, that kind of thing. And you're restricted on where you can go because you always have to play the card for the zone, the organs, that you're going to play in, and then you don't get that back until a couple of rounds later. So you've got to be able to plan ahead as well as think about the here and now. You're trying to get points for yourself, but then you've got to try and deny points to the opponents. There's a reasonable amount to think of here in terms of depth, but rule-wise, so straightforward. The cards, easy to read. It's just iconography. There's six of them, and they're on your reference board, detailing exactly how they work. And most of the actions you may not necessarily even use. You might never get a card that allows you to absorb a virus, in which case, don't need to learn it. The step-by-step -step process of the phases of the round is on the board itself from one to six. You basically just follow it through with the icons and the text and just, there you go. It pretty much teaches you the game from the game board. But even without that, the rules are simple. It looks great. The artwork is great. This is another underrated gem in my book. It was a Dice Tower Essentials game and yet nobody really talked about it. But area control game in 90 minutes or less? I'd say you can probably get this one done in 60 minutes, actually, if you're pretty au fait with the game and don't play with a full player count. But you're talking 90 minutes absolute max for a simplistic area control game. There's not many of those around, really, that I would consider to be good fun. This one, though, it's got a funny little theme because, yes, I know you're infecting the guy's body and I know we're in COVID at the moment, but the viruses all look like, like you know, like cutesy, weird abomination cartoons and stuff. So it's not taken seriously in any way, shape or form. It's a cool game, though. Not hard to learn, but certainly will keep you thinking and cursing a lot at your other players in order to figure out where to go next.
My number seven is Dale of Merchants, and I would like it to be higher up the list, but then I have to accept that a deck builder is probably going to have that little bit of inherent complexity that otherwise might deter some players. Now, normally I would probably think, well, hang on, don't put any deck builder on this list, but Dale of Merchants just has that very simplistic feel to it, yet has good amounts of depth from whichever set you buy. Buy one of the mini sets, you get six different factions, and there you go. Get the master set along with some of them, and then you'll have all sorts of different combinations. But the premise is very simple. Build eight stools. Okay, how do you build a stool? Well, you've got one out of four actions on your turn. One of those actions you almost never do anyway, a discard and redraw. So you've essentially got three actions you need to be aware of. One of them is build the stool, which is not exactly difficult. And then the rest of it is the whole buy a card or play a card. So really, the only complexity in this game is the card abilities themselves. But even then, they're pretty straightforward for 90% of the story, really. I mean, one of them may just simply go like, oh, when you use this to purchase a card, it's worth two extra than what it normally is. Okay, nothing too difficult there. The cards themselves are easy enough to read, and the fact that this is all kind of like weird animals and cool artwork and cartoons and that just makes it a little bit easier on the eye and a little bit easier on the brain in order to comprehend. But I didn't want to put it too high on the list on the basis of that little complexity. But depth-wise, whew, I mean, you know, if you get one set on its own, then there's so much, there's only so much depth. But all you need is one extra set on top and suddenly you mix and match the different uh, factions and you can create some interesting combinations of like different paths to victory and different combos that you can build. But then even if you do have just one set, you don't necessarily use all factions in the box depending on the player count. So again, you can get some cool combinations of do you have a game where everybody's interacting with others in mean ways? Do you get one that the market is used more often? Do you get a faction that allows you to build stores easier? There's a lot of variety. There's a lot of different paths to victory and combos to be had definitely I think is probably one of the few deck builders I can imagine that should deserve to go on a list like this. Oh joy, another white game. Oh well, hopefully this one wasn't too much of a hassle. Whistle Stop is my number six. Whistle Stop is a game that I only just managed to get into the collection recently. I played it, what, like two, three years ago? I think once at the Games Expo at one of Paul Grogan's parties. Liked it, despite the fact I hate trains. Although, to be honest, this could have been re-themed with pretty much any theme whatsoever to do with transportation. It really didn't need to be trains. But even then I thought, oh, this is pretty good. Maybe someday I'll play it again. Took me about three years to get it back into the collection. It's like, oh yeah, I'll buy a second-hand copy because I thought it was a bit expensive, brand new. Bought a second-hand copy for half the cost. I thought, come on, was it as good as I remember? It is so good, in fact, that this has the easy chance of hitting my top 100 next year. This is a great pick up and deliver game where you have these trains and you're setting them from one end of the map to the other, but it's done a bit like Tesuro and Metro where you put down these hexes with all these spiraling different routes on them. So you build the map as you go through and your trains go off into all sorts of different directions, making all sorts of stops to collect resources. And these resources can be taken to these major town tiles in order to collect shares or process them for various actions and points. And I say shares, I know for me, shares is like, Luke, you hate this sort of stuff, what you want about, it pretty much is set collection. I mean, you don't even have to call it a share company, you could just say it's the blue one, the green one, and the red one for all that matters theme-wise. So it's pretty simplistic. This is more about pick up and deliver and less about that whole 18 xx stuff. But this one is a very simple game. There's not a lot of rules at all. Movement is very straightforward. You essentially have so many action points and you use them to move as many of your trains, as many as spaces as you can afford. And then whistle tokens allow you to move them in a slightly different way. The town tiles themselves have got pretty straightforward abilities. There's an easy appendix. I can teach this game and get it going pretty easily. And then the depth comes from how you're going to get across from one map, sorry, the uh, one side of the map to the other. Because the routes go off in different areas, opponents are putting tiles near where you are, which means your train has to maybe detour or get sent off in a weird direction. And even then, what are you going to do? Are you going to gun it for the exit as quick as possible for the bonus points? Or are you going to take your time and hang around the middle of the board and do some cool back and forth with the town tiles? If you want to add a little bit more complexity, then you can put in the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the Rocky Mountains expansion which I've got in there, but even with the Rocky Mountains expansion in there, the complexity level's not that much higher, to be perfectly honest. It adds a cool little bit of setup and makes the game a bit longer, but in terms of rules teach, I think you pretty much have to teach like a few extra icons for like certain tiles, but then that's the same if you were to start it from scratch, and you basically have to say, oh, when you build on the mountain, you've got to pay an additional cost. 
Apart from that, that's pretty much all Rocky Mountain adds in terms of complexity. So you could pretty much teach the game with the expansion in it. But I really enjoy the whole getting the trains from one end to the other. I just like the fact that the map can just go off in all sorts of different directions. And the fact that the town tiles and that are set up randomly each game. It can make for some interesting combinations and some different paths to victory. Everybody's trying different things. If you've got five players, then be prepared for everybody to get in each other's faces. It's just a really cool game a really cool game for a pick up and deliver train themed game i never thought i would be like singing the praises of it but yeah it fits this this nicely because rules are pretty easy to teach but i can see the gears turning in people's heads when they're trying to decide what to do on their turn if you've not tried this and you like pick up and deliver games you owe it to yourself to give it a shot now seriously, I think most bird owners would send their pet birds after me to peck my eyes out if I didn't put Wingspan on the list. Wingspan is a very simple game to teach. The co yes, you've got the abilities on the birds themselves, but they're not particularly complex, particularly if you don't throw in one of the expansions. But the actions themselves, well, you've got four actions and they're all pretty much explained on the board itself. Really, the complexity is more just bird abilities, not the actual rules. So where does the depth come in? Well, the combos themselves. I mean, you've got to put these birds in different areas. You've got choices of where to put the birds on many occasions. You might decide, hmm, do I want this type of bird here to the points? Do I like the ability? What if I put this bird with this bird on the right hand side, then maybe when it combos through with all the actions, it can really get this engine going. It's essentially an engine builder at the end of the day, and you can approach it from many different ways. People might argue, well, there's too much luck in the game, therefore there's no depth. Look, Okay, yes, you draw cards from a deck for the birds. Terraforming Mars, anybody? Hmm? You know, so this one is a great game for this list. You know, I enjoy it a lot. It's got a very approachable theme. Yes, okay, the theme is not super strong in it, but in terms of a setting, it's beautiful. Looks the part. It's, you know, it's something better than 19th century Prague or whatever, you know, the hotness is right now. You know, so it, it really does just work. And if you want to add more depth, then just put in the expansions. You know, the expansions don't necessarily add much. Well, sorry, Oce the I can't speak for Oceana, but the uh, the recent one, the European one, had some extra abilities. You know, not that much else in the degree of complexity, though. It's just more birds that you can use. You know, the complexity doesn't go up that much compared to how high the depth factor can go up. As I say, I think there are games that fit this category a little bit easier than Wingspan, but... I can't imagine many people out there that would disagree with this choice. Although, uh, touch wood, every time I say that, I usually get me collar felt. So, I'll be interested to hear what you say in the comments. Bet you didn't expect to see this one on the list, Runestones. Yeah, Runestones has really been working for me nicely as a new deck builder. So, oh yeah, I was talking about a deck builder earlier. I didn't realize I had two on this list, but Dale of Merchant does have more in the way of abilities because you've got the different text on them. So, you've got to read lots of different abilities. Runestones, though, the abilities are literally just get gems or convert gems to this or sell gems. That's pretty much what the abilities are. And it's all done by iconography and... Each card has a very simple piece of iconography. In fact, the cards are laid out that you can read them left or right handed, which is pretty cool. But the cool with, factor with this is for as simple as this game is to teach, I mean, you pretty much have three actions to pick from, of which you're going to do two of them more often than not. And even then, one of them is buy a card, one of them is play two cards, and the other one is make an, uh, buy an artifact. Well, how do you buy stuff? Well, you pretty much spend the mana points or you spend the gems pretty straightforward but on top of this the depth comes from the abilities and the combos themselves you're making artifacts and when you do you get rune stones the rune stones give you points the more artifacts that you trade in for it but they also give you a really cool special ability that you have for the rest of the game so you have a decision do i go for lots of points every time i convert or do i just do lots of little little points because the longer you take to do the artifacts the less abilities you get but then the quicker you do the artifacts, the less points you get, but the more cool abilities you get. On top of that, the whole cool twist with this one being that when you play the two cards, the one with the higher value goes out of your deck and into a communal discard, or out of the game entirely if it's one of your starter ones. So while you're looking at what cards to play, you're thinking, well, I like this ability, but I don't want it to go just yet. Have I got anything lower than that? I could play this with that combo well if I put them like that. And you, can, it does really get your brain cells working, but not to an overwhelming degree. But even though there are games on this list I would add probably have like more depth, 
the fact that this one is just so, so simple, I mean, it is one of the simplest deck builders out there, it's, it's close to Dominion levels of simplicity, and I dare say possibly even slightly easier than Dominion in a sense, I mean, especially when most of it is just iconography and easily, like, a coloured board that's easy to read, this one really has kind of a won me over as a really solid deck builder, and I didn't think I'd be saying that very often about anything from Queen Games, because I don't mind Queen Games, they just haven't really, shall we say, uh, blown me away as much in recent years. They tend to be more sort of dry Euros. This one, though, was a bit of a surprise. A friend of mine, you know, brought my attention to it, and I'm glad he did. So, Runestones makes my four. Now, my top three were quite hard to arrange. I was thinking, oh, which one has that better ratio? Which one's more depth? This one makes my number three, though, on the underground. I have been singing the praise of this a lot lately. In fact, I've even done a, a solo play of it recently. This one is a really cool game. And I didn't think I'd be saying that about a game set about the London and Berlin metro system. But with this one, the rules are ticket to ride levels of simplicity. You essentially have four action points and you spend them on laying tracks or getting branch tokens. That's essentially half the rules already. The rest of the rules is where you place the tracks and how this lazy passenger moves. The idea being that this passenger moves from stop to stop based on the selection of cards and the golden rule is that it takes the easiest way possible. So the least amount of walking. Doesn't matter how many networks they use, they could go around the entire world by networks if it mattered, but as long as I don't have to walk that five feet, I'll take this route. So all the players are laying tracks in order to get the passenger to land on their networks, thus scoring them points. There's other ways to get points by connecting up certain bits on the map, so you've kind of got like an element of the ticket to ride route connection system, but also the whole new sort of unique system of trying to get this one aspect of the game to constantly use your track, so to make an efficient one or to steal routes from other players. You know, like somebody's built a route around here, but if I connect this server to here and here, then he hops on mine, completely bypass passes your system haha <laughs> in your face granted I wouldn't really want to play this with four and I will refuse to play it with five this is much better as a two or three player game but if you check out my recent solo mode video you can see the mini expansion the underground challenge where you can play this solo and I actually would say it's one of the most fun ways to play this game but it looks beautiful that stark white with the colors of the tracks on it it's blown up nice so you can read what's going on I love how simple this game is but as you'll see in my solo mode video you've got a lot of decision making to do about where to put tracks what where do you branch off you know which network to use here and which one to use there where's the passenger going to go now where could they go where have they yet to go there's a lot to think about despite the fact that I can teach you the rules to this in less than five minutes it's really solid you really need to try this game out preferably as I say if you're going to play it with less than four players my number two I'm going to have to hold up because it won't quite fit in that little space on the shelf that is awkward guess I was really I'm in an hour do I put this at number one but the reason my number one beats it is because the number one still makes you think quite a bit, but definitely has a lot less complexity than this one does. This one is not particularly complex, it's essentially a modern Cluedo game. But with this, you're trying to figure out who murdered this person, what was their motive, and the weapon they used. Okay, kind of like Cluedo, but there's no dice. You instead have these cards with the clues on there to eliminate suspects and that. But you trade them with other players, and you're trading clues. So you're getting information, but they're getting information, but you're hoping that you give them less information, then you gleam as you start figuring out hmm let's see there, there's nobody in the living room at that time uh, no one went through there so that means that uh, I, I can't remember their names Professor Plum we'll just use these you know if they can't go through the living room that means they couldn't reach the spanner which means they couldn't use that to murder the person the logic puzzle you have to figure out in this and this is on easy difficulty is already a brain burner you up the difficulty level in this and you can have suspects that lie to you with accomplices it gets ridiculous like you up the difficulty to a certain level and I will never figure Figure out who's done it but even on the easy mode it's pretty high def but complexity wise not a lot of rules you've got to learn the trading phase you have to understand in advance what the various like like different cards would mean like if someone says nobody was in this room what does that entail so there is a little bit of a learning curve but not too much particularly if anybody knows anything about the original Cluedo game but once you've got that down the debt factor, whoo, oh boy. I mean, you could argue that any deduction game could fit this list, but I would say that out of all the deduction games I can think of, where it's just pure logic deduction like this, you know, with some element of flexibility, this is definitely my favorite of the batch. It's a really cool game. Yes, okay, it's not exactly a looker, but it just, if you know, if you want modern Cluedo, there is no better version to get than this. 
And then finally for my number one, of course, the crew. It's got to be the crew, hasn't it? This tiny little game, this tiny little trick-taking game, one of the easiest games to teach, especially if you already know how to do trick-taking games. So you've already learned 90% of the rules. You've got 50 different scenarios in here for variety, and they get more complex as they go on. But even then, they're pretty straightforward. You essentially have to work with your other teammates in silence in order to win certain tricks at certain times from certain players, but you can't communicate except for a little token that you can use once and around and even then that tends to vary depending on the scenario but it's really simple to teach but the depth is there the fact you can't communicate and I know I've hated on games like the game and the mind before but those just seem like complete luck fest particularly the mind this one though has you able to make educated guesses if you know how trick taking works and when somebody plays that card or when they communicate this is my highest green in my hand you can start making educated gambles on well, hang on, if they've done that, then they must be trying to tell me this, because that would mean that I could play this card. They must believe I have this card. So that means if I play it, then they'll follow, which means they'll get the two, they'll win the two yellow, sweep, we're on roll. Right, let's play it. And then when the plan comes to fruition, it feels good. It gives you the sort of ability to make informed decisions a bit like Hanabi used to. Yeah, Hanabi, you had the cards facing away from you and people would say, this is a four, or this is a yellow. And it's like, well, why is someone telling me that this is a yellow? Why don't they just tell me this? Oh, and it's a bit like that. Everybody's gotta be on the same wavelength though, and it's harder to win this game than you might think. But the game can take anywhere from something like two seconds to about 10 minutes, depending on the scenario you're doing, and it will certainly get you thinking. Despite the fact that if you know how to do trick taking, I will teach it to you in about 60 seconds. If you don't know trick taking, I'll probably teach it to you in five minutes. Really low complexity ratio with a pretty decent amount of depth. Yes, there were more complex games on this list. That, you know, Awkward Guests clearly has more depth than the crew does, but you will not teach Awkward Guests anywhere near as quickly as you will the crew. Whew. So that's 10 games with a low complexity rating but high depth and I'm certain you're going to have games that would fit this list. Five Tribes gets mentioned to me all the time. I just feel that, that it crosses that line slightly at being a little bit too complex. But I can totally understand if you want to put Five Tribes as the list. That's why I keep mentioning it as an honourable mention. In fact, it's such an honourable mention that I believe it turned up in the Patreon choice as well. So yeah, the Patreon choice and my honourable mention are the same thing here. Five Tribes is definitely a good contender for this list, but it's just that borderline. It was really hard to decide. And like I say, if you think it should be on the list, I totally, totally understand. But hopefully you got something out of this list, and if you haven't seen the previous 10, then by all means go watch it. It was um, a darker day when the quality of my videos was not particularly, uh, shall we say, professional. But, uh, you know, hopefully you'll enjoy that list, and hopefully you got something out of this list as well. Now, I hope you've been enjoying the content on the Broken Meeple channel, but I'm not the only creator out there producing videos for your light entertainment. Forget about the big ones, we already know they exist. I'm talking about the smaller creators that deserve your time and deserve the support as well. Why don't you kickstart with this channel and see if they're right for you. Hey guys, what's up? I'm Jody, And I'm Justin. And we are Board Game Perspective. So our passions are board games and photography, and we want to show off the awesome world of board games through high quality how to play videos, cinematic sequences, and photography, etc. So our channel is in honor of my brother. He's actually the one that got us into loving board games. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but he wanted to leave us his entire board game collection, which consisted of over 200 board games, some of them of which are even behind us now. So if you guys are interested in following our channel, go ahead and search Board Game Perspective on YouTube, or you can find us at Board Game Perspective on Instagram if you want to follow some of our board game photography. So, thanks for watching today, we'll see y'all later. And thanks Luke for the shout out. So that's it for me on this episode of The Broken Meeple. If you like what you see and have earned your subscription, then hit the avatar in the center to subscribe and hit the bell for future notifications. Until next time, you can check out my most recent upload or a video suggested by me. Until next time, remember, it's only a game.